All right, folks, let's get into this chapter then. This is Raising the Living Dead <laughs> uh, by our old friend uh, Bishop. And, you know, again, I realize this book is, is somewhat advanced and it may be challenging for you to read this, but I try to persevere uh, because I think he, he's, he's really doing a good job of showing uh, how to apply, um, you know, uh, rhetoric and, and theories uh, to try to explain the role of zombies and sort of why we're drawn to zombies, why these are popular in, in the United States and, and elsewhere, and really what, what is the deeper significance of all this stuff? You know, why, <laughs> when, where, why, and how? You know, he, he really gets a, an analysis here that you can, you know, use to pattern um, your own essays, your own inquiries into a pop culture phenomena. So I hope you're enjoying it, and again, if it is, you know, if, uh, you know, I certainly don't expect you to understand every word in this and it'd be totally crystal clear. Uh, but do try to get the gist of it um, and come back to it later, maybe. Uh, reread parts uh, that were confusing before and I think you'll, uh, it'll begin to make sense. You know, maybe after this lecture you could, uh, you know, skim through it again and maybe some stuff that was uh, obscure might be a little easier to understand after hearing this. Let's hope. Uh, okay. Uh, so the objectives for today, then, we'll talk about uh, the history of folklore. I mean, uh, sorry, <laughs> the history of zombies as folklore, as uh, Bishop talks about it. We'll talk about what it, what does folklore mean? What is what it, what is that? Uh, he uses a folklorist named Bar Tolkien. Looks a lot like J.R.R. Tolkien, but it's spelled a little bit differently. Uh, but he's got some really cool concepts about, you know, what is folklore, and then he's got some. Uh, theories because of the twin laws of folklore dynamism and conservatism we'll get into that and then a little bit about uh eagleton and althusser and these um neo-marxist ideas basically uh, called ideology and ideological state apparatuses and how that pertains to zombies uh, so quite a bit going on in this chapter but i'll see if i can make it as, as simple as possible and relatable uh, okay now, so Bishop talks about how uh, the zombie, as we know it today, finds its origins in post-colonial Haiti. So you might you might have may or may not have heard of uh, post-colonial, what, what that means, or uh, even be able to uh, locate Haiti on a map. But uh, the idea with this post-colonial business is it's a historical term, basically. And there was a point in history where countries mostly uh, countries like uh, France, England, Spain, you name it, uh, but also the U.S. You might not know as much about the U.S.'s uh, role in this, but they were uh, these, these nations were uh, going to these other countries and taking them over and creating what they called colonies, uh, you know, in these other countries, trying to, you know, run their government. You know, you, to say they enslaved uh, the people might, you know, they, we, could, we could debate that. Uh, but there's certainly no question that there were, you know, th this was a hostile maneuver for a large part, right? The people, they were not happy <laughs> uh, about these uh, other countries coming into their their land, right, and, and setting up these uh, colonies. And so that's really what that term means. And we don't have enough time to go into all the history of it, but, you know, you can always take a history course uh, if you want to learn more. Uh, but anyway, Bishop says this is the sort of ferment... Um, where these zombie stories or zombie beliefs got started in this post-colonial, post just means afterward. So after the colonial powers left Haiti and Haiti was, you know, left to its own devices, uh, that's when this folklore about zombies arose and really took on, took hold. Uh, now he says that what's interesting about zombies as far as cinema is concerned is that uh, everything else, if you're talking about werewolves, vampires, you know, all of these uh, other kinds of uh, Frankenstein, uh, all of these other monster movies, basically, uh, they start off, uh, maybe they start off in folklore, but then they become novels. Maybe there's a, a poem about them. Maybe there's uh, plays, but they don't just go straight to film. Right? There's all sorts of stuff that, you know, the films will be based on the novels or based on the stage plays, uh, you know, kind of an updated media. Uh, whereas the zombies, Bishop says, just go straight from the folklore straight into 
uh, or almost uh, straight into uh, cinema, into movies. So that's kind of interesting. And we'll get a little bit later in the book, we'll talk about why that could be. Uh, he'll make a case that really zombies are great for cinema. There's unique things about zombies as monsters that makes them really good for movies uh, in ways that aren't really so applicable to those uh, other kinds of monsters. Uh, okay, so the zombies have a unique connection with the colonial history of the Americas, he says. This is on page 38. And Bishop says, The zombie remains purely a monster of the Americas, born from imperialism, slavery, and most importantly, voodoo, magic, and religion. So we've got uh, imperialism, you know, the colonial business I was just talking about. Uh, of course, slavery, you know, in the literal sense, here in the, in the U.S. before the Civil War. Uh, but we're really going to be talking a lot here about uh, voodoo. Voodoo is, is, a, is magic, but as a religion, as a, as a practice. And I think you'll find that. Uh, you know, I find it just kind of interesting in general, but it's really interesting when you think about how the, the zombie can trace its origins back to this, these, these voodoo practices. A lot of people don't know that, so <laughs> it's pretty cool. Uh, okay, Bar Tolkien, I think, is there's a picture of him. Uh, looks like a folklore, looks like a folk music singer to me, but anyway, he, he's a folklorist. So what is folklore? Uh, well, here's the definition. A culturally constructed communicative tradition informally exchanged in dynamic variation through space and time. A lot of stuff going on there, so culturally constructed. Uh, so these might not be, uh, you know, I guess the, the cultures has these stories that are kind of floating around. Uh, you know, moms are telling their children, grandparents are telling their grandkids about them, uh, friends are talking about them. You know, I guess you could think maybe like urban legends, you know, if you're familiar with that, that concept. Uh, so these stories are being told again and again and again, over and over again, and, and there's some parts that are kept the same every time, and then there'll be some parts that are updated or changed or customized, basically, to, to fit the, the situation. Uh, so that's really what um, all this, these terms mean, right? So if you think about fairy tales, for example, you know, always come back to those. We, we, we talked a little bit about this in the narrative perspective as well. Uh, so you have a, let's say, a fairy tale like The Boy Who Cried Wolf, if you're familiar with that um, fairy tale. This, <laughs> I think it's a shepherd or kid out with some sheep or something, and he, he keeps, uh, I guess he gets lonely or bored, and he thinks it would be fun to, to start screaming, oh, there's a wolf, there's a wolf. <laughs> a, wolf is, a wolf has come here to eat the sheep. You know, so the, all the villagers come in and they you know, look around for the wolf, don't see one. And, you know, it turns out the kid was just lying about the wolf just coming up with that just to get attention, basically. Um, and then, uh, of course, a little bit after that, there really is a wolf. <laughs> it comes and uh, starts menacing uh, the sheep, I guess. And he says, wolf, you know, starts crying wolf again. But uh, this time... Nobody listens. You know, they just think it's well. She, he's just lying again. He's just after attention, and you know, <laughs> you know, it turns out badly for the kid. Uh, so that is a story that's kind of folklore. You've probably heard that before, and you can uh, tell that story to people, and you can change up. Maybe instead of sheep, you know, make it something else. Instead of a wolf, you know, you can make it something else. But there's certain parts of that tale that have to be intact uh, for even to be considered the story, right? You know, the boy who cried wolf. And we can, the parts that you have to keep the same, I guess, uh, would be conservative. You know, just thinking about the title of the story, the boy who cried wolf. <laughs> you know, I, I would think you'd have to have, a, at least have the boy and the wolf in there uh, for that to be the story. You'd have to call it something else, I guess, if you, if you change those two elements. But, you know, there's certainly a lot of, you could add scenes to that. Uh, there's various ways you could update it. You could uh, you know, make it more metaphorical, you know, however you wanted to do it. Um, but the parts that are, would be the same are called conservative, and then the parts that you can play around with are called uh, dynamic. So dynamic just means changing. You know, th these are parts you can take that part out, put another part in. You know, that's called dynamic. Uh, if it's got to be in there, if you take it out and it's no longer the same story, that's uh, a conservative element. Uh, so that's the uh, the gist of this, you know. And coming back, of course, this this boy who cried wolf fairy tale. One of the reasons I wanted to uh, mention that is that 
it is a story with a moral to it, right? You tell this to kids, uh, especially if a kid is lying about something just to get attention, right? That, oh, my, you know, there's a, uh, I just saw a uh, dragon or I just saw some, you know, some, some, uh, guy in a hockey mask or something <laughs> you find out it's just a, a story just to get your attention uh, there really wasn't anything like that it was just a made up uh, so you might tell the kid the story about the boy who cried wolf and the idea there is that you know the, the kid hears this and thinks oh i see what happened there maybe i shouldn't be lying <laughs> uh telling lies like this just to get attention right there's sort of that moral message to it um so that's how the, these tales work. That's the reason they're moved along is because parents and grandparents and you know, whoever it is figures out, hey, this story kind of works. You know, it, it, you know, if I tell this story to kids, they, they, they get it. You know, the, the message makes sense to them, and then they quit lying. <laughs> Less likely to, you know, anyway. So that's a really simplified version of what uh, all this is about. And now another wrinkle here. And this is Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet. So she kind of talks about folklore too, but she's got an interesting point. I thought it was pretty cool to think about this. Uh, so she says, you know, you got these people that are telling the stories, you know, like I did, but that's not really folklore. I think she calls that folk life. Um, it becomes folklore when people like uh, Bar Tolkien here, and I guess her, you know, start to write this stuff down and study it and share it with students, you know, and then it becomes, you know, basically gets written up and studied. And at that point, it's folklore. <laughs> so they're kind of producing the folklore um, by doing exactly that, right? They're identifying things, designating it as such. And you may have heard of uh, the Grimm's fairy tales or the Brothers Grimm. You know, they're the, uh, they're very famous folklorists. They were, I think, English or not English, uh, German, but they were studying linguistics, and they, uh, as part of that, I suppose, they went out to the countryside and just started talking to, uh, to people they found there and collecting the, these stories that became the Grimm's fairy tales. But <laughs> it's a really, really fascinating, uh, you know, especially if you go back and read, because some of those are pretty famous stories. I think there's, I want to say, like Rapunzel's in there. Uh, but even later stories, uh, like The Little Mermaids by Hans Christian Andersen. Uh, but anyway, the, the fun thing is if you read the original stories and then read some of the modern uh, versions, especially these Dis Disney-fied versions we'll talk about here in a minute, <laughs> you'll see that they change them up quite a bit. A lot of these original stories are quite horrific. You know, it would scare the heck out of a kid. You know, give them nightmares. <laughs> so, you know, they kind of sanitize those elements out uh, for the modern audience. Okay, uh, so let's uh, think uh, briefly about one of those. Uh, so I mentioned a couple already. Snow White, Cinderella comes to mind, um, but any of the, you know, Disney movies or something else. I think we mentioned Wicked a few times, and there's a couple other stories we've we talked about in this class, but, you know, just think about a, uh, a movie or a story, a novel, whatever, where it's kind of based on an old fairy tale, but they've updated it, if you will, changed it up to make it fit a, a modern art audience. So I just want you to think about which parts do they keep the same and put those under a list called conserved, and which parts do they change and put that under a little list called uh, dynamic, and then just see what you can come up with to answer the question. Why do you think it was okay to change those parts that are under the dynamic part, and why do they keep the stuff uh, under the conserved uh, list? So just think about that a little bit, and then we'll move on. Okay. So where do zombies come from? Now, I'm not going to go through the whole uh, chapter with you. You can certainly read this. There's quite a bit of detail. Uh, but just in broad strokes, uh, we're, again, pointing at Haiti. And the idea there is there's something unique going on in Haiti. Uh, he calls it a land of synthesis and hybridity where Western Christianity fused, albeit irregularly, irregularly, with ancient African rituals and mysticism. Uh, so there's a lot of history uh, in Haiti of uh, ruthless uh, exploitation. I mean, it's pretty hideous uh, stuff. Uh, and then even after the, uh, you know, the enslavers or the slave, uh, you know, the slavers, I guess, were, were 
run off uh, and they, uh, the, the uh, revolutions happen and self-rule, uh, but it was a very violent time. You know, all these uh, leaders would come up and there would be some war, civil war, I suppose, big, you know, um, uh, fights, fighting, uh, a lot of death, a lot of murder, a lot of destruction. And so it's a really um, hard place <laughs> to be uh, even after the, uh, you know, the, col uh, the colonists were gone or the uh, imperialists were gone. Um, and at the same time with of that, you had the voodoo happening, which, you know, we'll get more into this in a second, but um, voodoo, at least as uh, Bishop describes it, is a sort of a mix or synthesis. You know, you got these elements from Christianity, Catholicism, uh, sort of being mixed up with uh, these really ancient African rituals, mysticism, and it kind of gets uh, put together in interesting ways. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about, about that. Uh, yes, and the, re the reason that uh, America comes into this story is in 1915, there's this invasion of Haiti, and you can read about that and watch <laughs> documentaries about it if you want more detail. Um, but, you know, it, was, it, was, uh, it wasn't like the, the Marines came in and it was all happy, uh, ha happily ever after. You know, actually, it was, it was quite, uh, quite terrible what happened. Uh, and again, I'll leave it to you if you want to uh, read more about this. But, you know, it was a combination, I guess, of uh, trying... I think they thought they were kind of modernizing Haiti, building roads and bridges and schools and things, but they uh, were using a forced labor, you know, to do that. But yeah, it was a. I guess the soldiers, the Marines, came back and they uh, had stories to tell about their experiences there. And, and then, of course, uh, uh, professors, researchers, scholars, you know, they heard about some of these stories and they went to, to Haiti and talked to people and. You know, basically started collecting the folklore, like the Brothers Grimm. And so I guess they heard about this thing. Zombie? What's a zombie? <laughs> you know, and, and what's, what's this voodoo thing? Uh, so they were studying all that stuff and then coming back um, to America with stories about it. You know, they wrote it up and people were fascinated by it. And eventually it made its way into, into film. Okay, so according to Bishop, there's two voodoo beliefs. And remember, voodoo is, is this mix of... Uh, you know, all this stuff, but it includes some uh, Christianity in there. Uh, so part of it is the human soul. So the understanding of the human soul as something tangible or, or real uh, that can be captured and manipulated by black magic. Uh, so there's, if you read the chapter, they talk about how they can sort of suck your soul out <laughs> through a crack in the door. <laughs> so, like a soul is a real solid thing, uh, is one of the beliefs. Um, and the second one, the zombie has an allegory the zombie's allegorical function as a metaphor uh, for enslavement. Uh, so we'll get into this here uh, really soon, but the, the scary thing about zombies in this uh, folklore, it isn't that the zombie's going to bite you and eat you or, or turn you in. Um, the zombie will bite you and you'll become a zombie. You know, the idea is more like you'll be brainwashed or you'll be, uh, you'll be deprived. You'll basically become a robot. Uh, unable to uh, act, you you lose your free will basically, and you'll have to do whatever the uh, uh, sorcerer tells you to do. Uh, that's what what's scary about this this kind of zombie. Yes, slaves under the control of a sorcerer called a bokor, who zombifies them. Okay, so this is where it gets really weird. <laughs> so, so zombies actually exist. Um, not the zombies in The Walking Dead, obviously. Uh, but there is, uh, apparently, you know, and I've heard different people talk, you know, and there's plenty of shows you can read about this or uh, watch about this topic as well. But uh, apparently, I'll just uh, say what Bishop says, and you can do your own research. But he talks in here about a couple of books, Serpent in the Rainbow, and uh, is it Hurston, I think? Uh, they go there and, and write up some of these results. And I'm, and I'm pretty sure there's some shows on <laughs> Netflix about some of this stuff. Uh, but anyway, apparently there's this powder, and I didn't put the name of the powder. Oh, there it is. Contre Poudre. Contre Poudre. looks like French. Uh, but anyway, there's this, this powder, and you'll see this in the movie uh, White Zombie. Uh, it's basically, it's a kind of toxic poison, so it takes your breath away, literally. You know, you don't move. You sort of become dead. 
<laughs> not literally dead, just kind of, I guess, dead enough to fool people into thinking that uh, you're dead. So uh, the idea is that actually is a thing. You know, toxins like that aren't just fictional. You know, there are stuff that you know, does that kind of thing. So uh, I guess the gist of this is there is some basis, however limited in some scientific explanations as, as to how somebody might become zombie foot. Uh, anyway, moving on from that, uh, Bishop talks very briefly here about some pretty uh, heavy-duty theorists. Uh, I call them neo-Marxist theorists, and I know we haven't quite gotten to that chapter yet in the Cell Now book where she talks about what a neo-Marxist is. Uh, but just for now, it's, it's basically this idea that um, states, they call them states, could be a government like the U.S., not a literal state necessarily like, like Minnesota, but just, you know, sort of the powers that be uh, the government. Um, that's called a state. And the idea is these, these states exercise a kind of power to control the population. You know, make people go to work, <laughs> make people follow the law, and uh, so on and so forth. Now, the idea here is, or the Terry Eagleton and Althusser, what they're talking about with ideology and ideological state apparatuses, is that you really don't want to have to use too much physical force. Uh, so you're not a very, your government's not going to last too long if you're always having basically to put people in jail or, or shoot them or, you know, uh, torture or, you know, physically force them to, to do things. Um, you know, they're just going to overthrow you. <laughs> you know, there will be a revolution in a very short order if that's the only way you have of, uh, you know, uh, uh, running the country. Uh, so instead, they don't really rely on that stuff too much. They call that repressive state apparatuses, like uh, you know, mil the military, martial law, that, that sort of thing is, is only used in limited. It's very sparingly, sparingly used. Uh, it's much preferred to have something called ideology or I ideological state apparatus, according to Althusser. And these are basically systems. It could be schools. It could be religions. You know, it could be folklore. Uh, as we'll see, or films, uh, anything like this. And the idea is it kind of convinces people, you could think about it as brainwashing or manipulation if, if you want, but it just uh, basically lets, um, you know, it encourages people to, again, follow the law, to be productive citizens, to uh, respect the government, respect authority, you know, whatever the case may be, uh, in, by having ideas, right? So you kind of mentally... Um, persuading them, I guess, to follow the law rather than, uh, <laughs> you know, using physical force or threatening them with, with some kind of violence. Uh, so that's the idea here. And according to Althusser and Eagleton, you know, governments are successful states anyway. They, they're far more reliant on the, the ideology uh, than they are on those, uh, you know, the, the army. Uh, okay, so they, uh, our bishop says that this is where zombies into the picture in Haiti. He says in, in Haiti, the zombie is not just a fun story or a, you know, a horror film. It's actually part of the law. You know, it's, it's taken very seriously, and it's used as one of these ideological state apparatuses to kind of, kind of keep people in line, uh, you know, keep people going to work, uh, keep people doing all this labor, you know, working for <laughs> next to nothing um, because they're afraid of the zombies. You know, this is a serious thing uh, in Haiti. Uh, so he's got some proof I thought was interesting. You probably did too. That uh, again, this idea that it's not just a fairy tale. It's not just considered fiction if you go to Haiti. Uh, Bishop points out that if you look at the legal code, the law, the official law, it actually talks in here about that uh, that that powder I was talking about a while ago. The the administering of a substance that uh, without causing actual death produces a lethargic coma more or less prolonged, so you can go to jail for that if you're caught with this powder. <laughs> uh, so this is kind of proof that, you know, the government is kind of sanctioning this belief in the zombies, right? They're, so you could imagine if you're a Haitian citizen and you, you realize, hey, there's actually a law uh, that says, you know, that, you know, you go to jail for having this, this powder, so the powder must be real, right? And, the, and zombies must be real or they wouldn't have the, uh, a law like that. And I'll just give you an, another example that just kind of occurred to me as I was saying this. Uh, I've heard people say that if you fly on an airline, uh, they always make sure that either the pilot or the co-pilot 
Uh, one of them has to be an atheist, <laughs> at least not a Christian, uh, with the idea being that uh, if there's a rapture and all the Christians are suddenly you know, taken up into heaven, uh, they don't want to let, let the plane just be flying without you know anybody in the cockpit. So <laughs> that's an example there. <laughs> now, I haven't even bothered to look. I just assume that's false. I haven't even bothered to, to look into that. Uh, but if it turned out that that was true and that was actually part of the, you know, the legal code, the, uh, was it the flight F, um, you know, the Flying Aviation Association, <laughs> whatever that's called. <laughs> you know, if it turned out that was actually there in the law, then it'd be kind of similar to this, right? It'd be like the state would basically be saying, hey, there's, there's something to this idea of a rapture, right? We take it seriously enough to have it uh, as part of the, you know, part of the legal or operating procedures of, of the plane, uh, so that would, you know, make it seem more believable, not just the everyday person. Uh, okay, uh, so a little bit more about this idea of using the folk story or folklore about zombies to control the, the people, or they call them here, the, the peasants. Uh, so Bishop makes the point that it's not just the poor people, right? it's actually more terrifying for the rich people or the elite classes uh, because basically they they like their way of life you know they're not 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 out there toiling in the fields you know they have all the you know the stuff that they, they're doing i guess they live uh, yeah wealthy affluent lives so it's, it's in a way uh, even more horrifying for them to think that they will have they will not only lose all of that wealth and the nice life in the the big house, I think, is how they <laughs> refer to that. Uh, but they'll be controlled, being uh, you know uh, hypnotized or brainwashed or whatever uh, by these people. They look down upon so much, and so it's kind of a flip, you know, flipping uh, the scales, and it makes it even more uh, horrific for them. So I thought that was an interesting thought. Okay, so think about how the belief that zombies are real and that anyone can be enslaved by a sorcerer or a bokor encourage believers to behave in certain ways. For, for example, perhaps they work harder or complain less. <laughs> you know, if you're out there, uh, I guess this is sugarcane, it's very intensive work. It's very hard work and, and dangerous. Uh, so maybe if this belief in the zombies keeps you working hard, even though it's hot and miserable, uh, you, you still don't complain because you're afraid that if you do, you might become a zombie, and you know, that'd be far worse than the, <laughs> the conditions you're in. <laughs> okay, so think about, that's, uh, you know, Haiti, zombies might seem far removed uh, from your life, but I want you to think, is there anything, now you can't use the one I just gave you <laughs> about, the, uh, about the airline, but is there anything else that you've heard that's, that's kind of like this, that kind of reminds you of something like this, that uh, some kind of belief that, whether true or not, well, you don't even have to get into that, uh, just is there a belief that you think encourages people to support the status quo and not to question authority? So think about that, maybe an urban legend, or something you heard growing up, a fairy tale, whatever the case may be. Uh, just think about that for a few minutes and then we'll finish up here. Okay, so we're going to finish up here with uh, why the zombie came to Hollywood. So again, part of Bishop's argument in his book, and one of the things I think is pretty cool is he's, you know, he's again he's saying there's something unique about zombies and the the Haitian history and this connection to the U.S. Um, and part of this is that the U.S. United States was you know once a colonial entity itself. There were still vestiges of this, by the way, you know, in, in some of these territories. Uh, you know, that the U.S. <laughs> still claims. I'm not going to get really you know into into that here. I just just I want you to be aware of that. Um, so there is a little bit of history we just mentioned in, you know, 1915, the uh, U.S. Marines over there to protect some of the, uh, you know, corporate interests and in, the American corporate interests there in, in Haiti. Uh, so that that's fact, you know, that's history. Uh, and then B, slavery had been an essential part of the U.S. economic and social system for many years, basically up, up until the Civil War. You know, there was literally... Uh, you know, slavery right here in the U.S. You know, not something people you know typically like thinking about, but you know, it's, it's important history. And Bishop, you know, connects this, uh, the sort of guilt over this. You know, of course, the racism 
these lingering wounds uh, from this you know, history of slavery and the, and the Civil War. He says all this kind of combines into a, what he calls a collective social guilt. You know, you're probably not aware of this, right? It's almost kind of a subconscious thing that we have in, in the culture. It's kind of cultural subconscious, you know, thing that kind of, you know, is bothersome. It's been repressed. You don't think about it, but it's still there, and it produces uh, anxieties. Uh, but he says, uh, this is all what paved the way for zombies to invade the U.S. in the form of feature films. Uh, so I, <laughs> it's a pretty profound uh, idea, but I think you'll start to see it, you know, especially when you watch this, uh, uh, this movie, White Zombie. Because uh, in that movie, we'll talk more about it next time, uh, but you really see more clearly, I think, this connection to Haiti and voodoo and the... You know, the colonialism, the, imperial, the imperialism era. Uh, anyway, there's a lot in this uh, chapter. I, know I realize it was some kind of a, a very complex in some parts, but you know, I hope that you were able to get the gist of it anyway and, and find it interesting, if a little bit um, scary, really. Um, anyway, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. If you have any questions, comments, please share those, and I will see you next time.